Hello, everybody. Uh, Stephen Anderson here. I'm the Marketing Communications Manager for Woolpits in the Asia Pacific region, region even. Um, this, uh, before we start, if you have questions, uh, please place any questions in the Q&A tab at the uh, top of your team's window there, and we'll um, get to those at the end. Some of them we might have to answer after the call, but um, definitely uh, we'll endeavour to answer all questions. Um, Abigail and Dan, so Dan Grimmel, he's our sales manager for Asia Pacific, will be um, leading the discussion and Abigail and colleague from Acopia AI in Canada joins us uh, late night. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Abigail will be running us through the Acopia AI offering. Um, so without further ado, I'll um, jump off and hand over to Dan uh, to talk about uh, Woolpit. Uh, thanks, Stephen, and uh, thanks all those that are uh, that logged on early. I'm sure we'll have a, a few more people that come through, but uh, yeah, really um, looking forward to presenting you today. Just a bit of an agenda. Uh, hopefully, most of you on the call um, will be fairly familiar with uh, with who Woolpit is, but we'll just do a a quick quick introduction there. Uh, I'll then hand over to Abigail, who introduced Ecopia, uh, talk about the land cover product, which is uh, the feature and focus of, of today's webinar. And then uh, we'll go with a uh, case study or two. Uh, and we've also got a good uh, call to action with the uh, availability of a demonstration data set for everyone to get their hands on. Uh, we'll go with questions at the end, but as Stephen mentioned, um, please feel free to uh, pop any questions into the Q&A dialogue as uh, as they come to mind. Uh, so already introduced by Stephen, they're the, uh, they're the two presenters. Uh, myself, uh, the sales manager for uh, Woolpit in, uh, in Asia Pacific, um, based in Sydney usually, and I've got a, I've got a surveying background. So all this uh, um, GIS data sets is very, very close to my heart and my uh, technical upbringing. And I'm really excited to see the advancements that uh, you know, the industry has made in terms of the automated detection and uh, creation of these data sets, which are uh, Abigail from uh, Ecopia will be uh, will be sharing with us a little bit. So, in terms of an introduction, um, I think uh, most of you will be reasonably, hopefully, familiar and have seen some of our uh, great messaging that Stephen and the marketing team have done over the course of uh, course of this year. Uh, but for those um, who might not have heard of Woolpit before, but uh, know a company called uh, AM. Uh, effectively, AEM uh, became part of Woolpit uh, at the end of 2021, and this year we've uh, undergone a bit of a, a rebranding exercise. So we've uh, changed the uh, the name of the company from uh, from AEM to Woolpit. So it's still the same company, um, still the same people, still the same services that we've uh, we've been offering in the region for uh, uh, for nearly 60 years now, um, but even better, um, as I'll as I'll show in the uh, in the next slide. But uh, Woolpit, for those who aren't familiar with it uh, before. We started uh, adopting that name. Uh, Woolpit are a geospatial um, architecture and engineering company uh, based and founded in the uh, in the US. And look, they've really got a um, you know, a vision to become one of the premier geospatial companies um, with architecture and engineering uh, globally. So they'd started to uh, look at expanding into the Asia Pacific region, and AM was a was a really good fit. And look, we're really excited to be part of Woolpit because it's kind of like a a big brother um, of us. They do all the same things that we do in terms of GIS and flying planes around with uh, with sensors and having surveyors on the ground. Um, so it's just really nice to um, be part of a um, company that is like-minded and comes from similar routes to, uh, to what we do. Some of the benefits that I just sort of alluded to in terms of, uh, you know, now that um, AM is, is part of Woolpit and Woolpit really is starting to expand on that, uh, that global footprint. Uh, so we've got enhanced expertise and resources. Um, so typically, you know, where we've had uh, a really experienced, um, you know, LIDAR and imagery processing team, uh, Woolpit has the same. So we've now been able to um, leverage off of having um, more people with uh, with these skills and really start to have some great conversations on uh, um, global knowledge sharing and then and then best practices. Uh, so with that comes an expanded talent pool as well. Um, you know, we're not just uh, constrained to one geographic region now. We can start to look at uh, expertise in multiple uh, countries, which really, really helps us out. Uh, the size and scale that we've got now um, does mean that we've got some focus on research and development. Um, so Woolpit in particular in the US um, has had some programs where they've been looking at uh, advanced sensor development. 
And uh, here in uh, here in Australia, we've really been quite at the forefront of doing uh, AI and uh, automation on, on LiDAR processing. So it's great to uh, combine all that together to create a, a global offering. Uh, well, then another key thing on this um, you know, as being a global company is the international partnerships that come, come with it. Uh, we've got some global partnerships now and we've certainly got uh, yeah, a lot of dialogue with uh, with people in um, lots of different countries who are doing great things, and I'm really happy to be featuring Ecopia, who, you know, certainly in our opinion, and uh, and I'd say theirs as well, are, are really leading the way in um, you know, AI detection and uh, and creating features from uh, imagery and, and geospatial data sets. Uh, just a bit of a snapshot um, for what effectively we uh, we offer in the region. Um, uh, I heard someone describe it the other day um, on a call as a as a full stack geospatial provider. Um, that's sometimes a uh, uh, sometimes can be a weakness that we do do um, everything in the geospatial realm across a, a lot of markets. So we may not be particularly known for being experts or uh, you know the specialists in one particular field, but you know, certainly it also comes at a, at a great strength as well that some of our clients. Um, or some of our best clients and some of the best projects that we do are multidisciplinary, covering um, a whole host of uh, geospatial uh, applications. So I think for a lot of you, you might be familiar with, uh, you know, maybe our airborne mapping in terms of lidar sensors and imagery sensors and some of the derived products that might come from that. Um, or perhaps you're uh, you're familiar with our uh, our GIS work. But uh, what I would encourage, uh, you know, we still find in a lot of conversations that we have with people. Uh, that someone might be aware that we do GIS, but have no idea that we do aerial mapping or, or vice versa. Um, so if there's anything there, if you use us for, for one area um, and your business has need for uh, for other geospatial uh, inputs, you know, please reach out um, you know, either to the marketing team, myself or your account manager, and just uh, let us know and we'll be happy to share with you, uh, share with you more details. Uh, so with that, that's enough on uh, introducing Woolpits. So I'll uh, hand over to Abigail to do an introduction to herself, Ecopia, and the, and the really exciting 3D land cover product. Awesome. Well, good morning, everyone. And Dan, thanks for that intro. Um, yeah, so we're, I'm actually out of Toronto in Canada, so just, just a day behind, but it looks like the future is bright over there. So excited to be here and speak a little bit about the 3D land cover we're going to be maintaining with Wolpert across all the major metros across Australia. And before I dive deeper into that and how it really can be used to make change within all these applications, for those of you who don't know us, I'd love to just talk a little bit to what we're trying to solve as a company um, and so that you can really understand, you know, where we're trying to bring value to users like you. And so I think we all understand that our industry has been waiting and continues to aspire to bridge the gap between the physical and the digital realms through the large scale use of digital twins. And these dynamic real time reflections of our world are going to empower organizations to simulate, analyze and optimize their operations, fostering obviously predictive maintenance, cost savings, and of course what we're all looking for enhanced data driven decision making. And our mission at Ecopia is to make all these aspirations a reality by providing the foundation of this digital twin with highly accurate and regularly maintained 3D base maps. And so as we're all aware that as the market currently stands, geospatial data users have to make these continuous trade-offs between affordability, accuracy, currency, and the scalability of their data. And that's kind of why that digital twin at countrywide scale hasn't been achieved yet. And so you kind of have these options, right? You can access automated softwares and use them to process really large areas of imagery very quickly and at a lower price than manual digitization. But then when you look at the results, there's only 60 to 70% of the features and visible in the imagery being captured and their shapes don't match those underlying features. And so that means you have this accuracy gap that's now happened. And so all that time you just saved automating and all the costs you just saved through automating are just going to be completely offset by the fact that you're going to be spending the same amount of time and cost just fixing this data. And then, of course, you can always go with the really traditional map source, the manual digitizers. And once you train these teams, you can get a really high quality data set. But we all know it takes a lot of time making the data pretty much outdated before you get it, or you're spending a lot of money to get it really quickly, which means you can only do that really once in a while, right? That's why we see those every five year cadences, every 10 year cadences. And you also have to account for the cost and time of creating the training materials and reserving thousands of hours to really review that data and make sure it's consistent. And so this time versus cost trade-off 
means that it hasn't been feasible to keep the maps up to date at the cadence that change is happening at. And I think we all know, right, that what a city looks like today it's going to vary drastically in six months just based on how trends and how urbanization is going. So let alone the difference you'd see in three to five years and all the things missed during those time horizons. And so really this is harming the power of having effective policies and the ability to track the success of strategies that you're trying to implement because you're really just always working off of older data. And this is why Ecopia's AI enabled systems are just so powerful. We extract data at countrywide scales in record timelines while maintaining the accuracy that you achieve through manual digitization. And in addition to being quick and affordable, because the data is normalized using Ecopia's AI systems outputs, it allows us to do true updating instead of map recreation, which is absolutely critical for the digital twins the market's currently demanding. And we can achieve these results because of our proprietary semi-automated approach which merges the output of a best-in-class neural network that we've spent over 10 years creating and a robust, highly automated quality control process. So this ensures when you get your data, you can use it right away, and there's not gonna be the need for months and months of quality control. And of course, I wanna be clear that just because there is some manual involvement, making sure that we're hitting those accuracy requirements that we're committing to to you, it doesn't mean that now it's like the same speed I just spoke to. Like we're creating this data very quickly. So as you can see, we mapped Taiwan and South Korea, all the buildings in 3D and forests as well in just three and a half weeks. And then for some of you who've uh, been in geospatial for quite a while, you might also know about the fact that we were the footprint supplier for Geoscape for six years and really were the ones who really took that map up off the charts with that countrywide scale and six month creation. But let's go back now to the 3D land cover across the cities of Australia and what we're building with the team at Wolpert. So of course, this data is being built from Wolpert's high resolution, 10 to 15 centimeter imagery, and is gonna include features like 3D buildings, 3D trees, sidewalks, driveways, railways, parking, forest, grassland. And the data is gonna achieve a positional accuracy of 50 centimeters across the full data set. And we will update this annually with Wolpert's cadence that they're updating their cities at. And that's why we were so excited to partner with Wolpert and really see this as being game changing for the entire market. So let's dig into the actual details of this high quality data I'm talking to you about. So first, Ecopia extracts buildings as building footprints. It's not an outline, it's a footprint, which means we're positioning the structure where it actually meets the ground. And again, that's not a rooftop product. And that's why if you're looking at this data here, it appears that there's potentially a misalignment between the roof and the imagery. Um, and that's again, because we're doing that building footprint. So we're modeling the walls, the grounds and the rooftop to position accurately. And that's super important um, because think about if you're working with super tall buildings and you're doing roof level, you could have structures in like some of these areas that can be off by 300, 500 meters which is quite a distance to have your building not rightly positioned if you're really trying to use it for any kind of application that has to do with logistics. And then when we look at the townhouses here, um, our AI is completely able to use uh, the different markers they're seeing in imagery and to accurately divide them. And again, this goes back to like what you're trying to use this data for, even if it's just a census perspective or your delivery person, this individual building delineation is super important. And then as you can see here, there's trees overhanging a building. And even though there is this partial obstruction in the imagery, we're still able to extract those individual buildings. Our features are not just cut off where those obstructions happen. And obviously that's very different than what other AI systems are doing. For the 3D buildings, the different height components of the buildings are gonna be captured. So you can see here, this is like a complex structure. There's many different heights circled in the image here. Um, and so to handle all those different heights and make the metadata make sense, we're assigning the building's base with its own unique identifier, CID. And then you're also, each different level is gonna be tied back to that CID um, so that you can you know, have those differentiated heights, have them visualize, understand those different heights, but still tie them back to that base, making the data easy to use. And then when you look at the heights themselves, you have both an absolute height and a relative height being assigned. Um, and even like when you're looking at the top of a church, right? So this is a LOD 1.3 structure. Um, so you'll have these small components as long as the footprint of it, it's larger than nine meters squared extracted. And this is just an example of it visualizing the 3D space where you can see really that all those different height components, those complex shapes, 
what they look like in the imagery they're going to be extracted from. Um, and when we're looking at the 3D workflow, if anyone's tested um, any of this, any other potential automated solutions, um, you'll see there's usually a lot of topology issues. And of course, for us, we're making sure, again, this is like manual level data. It's ready to use. So you're going to have all standard topology rules being followed there. None of the buildings are going to be going through uh, each other in layers or the ground, of course. Um, so it's all logical. And really what's exciting about this 3D workflow and what I spoke to briefly earlier is that it's not just that the fact that we're really getting these 3D buildings at scale like the South Korea and Taiwan in three and a half weeks. It's really that this enables the efficient updating of layers over time. So as a result of automating the photogrammetric process, Ecopia's AI is referencing millions of points within the data to accurately position a feature on the ground, which then allows us when new data is being ingested to accurately reference those new points against those historic features Ecopia has extracted and then understand again, what are these changes that are happening? And so we're not re-extracting everything. It's really just an efficient update process. So going back into some of the 2D, so when you look at roads, um, we're going to follow all the standard topology and we'll even have widths attribute to these features. So you can see that here in this area. And then obviously we're going to have nodes um, at all the intersections. And of course, there won't be any undershoots or overshoots unless that's where our road's actually ending. And we understand that many government authorities and even our commercial clients will likely have some kind of existing metadata structures in place. So we can use their existing naming conventions. That's what you're seeing here for Contra Costa in California um, to just make it really again so that when you get this data, it's easy to use and it goes into your system. And lastly, when it comes to the land cover, um, you'll see again, it's all these features are still going to be maintaining that same high level of quality. And so all the features are contiguous. Um, and so there's not going to be any holes in that data. So I hope that's demonstrated because I know a lot of the times when people talk about high quality AI, uh, once you dig into the details, it might not be as high quality. So I think that's demonstrated to you that, you know, this is really the same quality delivered by good manual teams. But of course, we're delivering those unheard of timelines and that efficient updating. And so this ability has really led to huge improvements in many different verticals. And today I'll cover a few, starting with our role in climate resiliency. And so to really demonstrate the magnitude of our system and the improvements we're affording, I'll begin with a case study at a huge scale. So for the last 40 years, NOAA has been creating 30 meter land cover maps across all the coastal states in the US, which is over 3 million kilometers squared. And they were using open Landsat imagery. And the purpose of these maps was to support the CCAP program that had the objective of monitoring changes to the environment, both natural and uh, human made with the goal of improving decision making. And the team at NOAA really, what they were trying to do is empower their regional managers to make data back decisions and policies, and then update these um, and to allow them to adapt their strategies by monitoring this and evaluating the effectiveness essentially of what they're implying. And while that 30 meter data did offer general insights, you can see here, right, about the environment, due to the increasing impacts of climate change, the team at NOAA had for a while been strategizing to advance the product to a highly detailed one meter map product. I'm sorry, I just skipped a slide there. And so as they began to evaluate the market for a solution to take their coastal maps to these higher resolutions, they of course encountered the same issues the GIS industry has always faced. There was no one solution that was highly accurate, scalable, and also affordable, as we had discussed earlier. And then this in inability to get high quality data quickly was problematic based on what they were trying to do. And in this current environment where everything's changing so quickly and frequently, and then of course having drastic impacts on human life, especially when we look at natural disasters. And NOAA tested many solutions. And you can see here a direct comparison of their automated results using past methods that they had tried to employ. And then Ecopia's proprietary AI results here on the right. As the team at NOAA has explained publicly, um, their previous outputs they felt were quite accurate if you're just looking at like using an uh, automated algorithm, but they definitely didn't have the detail they needed. So houses weren't square or as well defined as they needed to be. Road edges weren't always straight. Tree canopy and shadows were all causing a m plethora of issues within the AI. So when you're looking here now at Ecopia's results, obviously they're much more detailed, they're granular and precise, individual buildings, 
with corresponding to the right shape there. Roads are obviously following standard topology rules, they're all straight. And of course, shadows and obstructions don't impact our ability to get you the right features in the right geometry shape. And so Ecopia's high quality results meant that NOAA didn't have to spend additional money to correct the outputs. And that also meant that they were saving tens of months when it came to being able to actually even use their data. Because the results they received from Ecopia were ready to use and truly then offered them the time and cost savings long promised by AI without them having to compromise on quality. And this is important because the increase in accuracy with the higher resolution allows for better modeling to occur. As you can see in the comparison again between these two data sets, the increased precision and detail achieved with the high resolution imagery and Ecopia's AI systems is allowing NOAA to do a lot more than just simply monitor change over time. This high quality data set is improving their hydrodynamic flood modeling. Uh, they're doing flood risk assessments now. And then even stormwater management and urban forestry are starting to actually use these data sets. And having that complete map of the individual buildings, roads, sidewalks, paved surfaces, and natural features is important for them to have a full picture of what changes have been happening and then to properly evaluate the impacts of the different events on the environment or even for them potential gaps in infrastructure. And when we're looking at that added level of detail, it's not just like the man-made features and you know some of that stormwater runoff. It's also important with natural features um, because we're getting a really good picture of our green infrastructure, which is again, allowing us to understand how much of our environment is natural and then protect those areas or st set strategies in place to improve them. So smaller, just because it's a smaller water body or vegetation feature, it's still playing an important role in our ecosystem. And when it comes to conservation or restoration site planning, having this detail um, NOAA has expressed is really gonna optimize their results. And so as a result of Ecopia's unique ability to create highly accurate land cover data at scale and the approved analysis it enabled with NOAA, Last August, Ecopia was selected to update all the coastal states and land cover maps, which equated again to over 3 million kilometers squared of land cover being mapped, over 70 million buildings from sub one meter imagery, and that was delivered to NOAA um, within five months. And while again, the scope of that project was quite huge and it's an ongoing effort and it's very impressive, the recency, accuracy and efficiency of updating is still so impactful at the city and region level. While global warming is impacting the full world, it's really our cities and our communities that are individually impact and really where a lot of policy is being shaped to adapt for these things. So we'll also now talk about the increase in paved services across our communities as a result of rapid urbanization and how we help the city of Detroit. So just to give a little context, as we reduce the amount of permeable surfaces in exchange for roads and buildings, we're really reducing the capacity for the earth to absorb precipitation. And in a natural environment, standard infiltration would handle 50% of water absorption with only 10% of that water rain um, happening to be runoff, right? So all the natural surfaces would be taking that water in and doing the natural processes. But today with our built up cities, we see infiltration handling only 15% of precipitation and 50% of it turning into water runoff. And so obviously that's definitely not improving our situation for, or our attempts to really reduce flooding. And not only is that putting significant pressure on stormwater assets, resulting in higher risks of flooding when they're not adequately designed and maintained, but it's also degrading water sources. So as polluted water runs off paved surfaces, it's entering rivers, lakes, estuaries, the ocean, and in fact, you know, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority found that land-based runoff is the greatest contributor to poor water quality and in inshore marine ecosystems. And so the city of Detroit was really feeling the impacts of these changes. They're having similar experiences and, you know, they're facing pressure to improve their sewer systems while also redeveloping their land to support greener infrastructure. But of course, they weren't receiving enough federal funding. So to access the funding needed to achieve these ambitious goals, they implemented a stormwater utility fee, and that's quite common now, um, and Dan will get into that in a little bit um, for a more Australian example. But of course, to fairly assign the stormwater utility fee, Detroit needed access to up-to-date and accurate impervious surface maps, as these would inform the amount of runoff a specific property was responsible for, and therefore the exact use of public resources. So after years of procuring data manually using a heads-up approach, 
The city of Detroit recognized that this wasn't really a long term solution as they were encountering several problems. Let's go into some of those problems. So the first is, of course, there's many challenges, but most clients are looking for very detailed vector vectors which require high levels of competence in interpretation. And this skills needed not only in, uh, in just creating it, but it's also you need the interpretation to be consistent year over year since fees are obviously assigned annually. And this is where Ecopia's AI is incredibly useful since the system is generating the features, you're always receiving consistent and uniform data. And so if the data is extracted all the same way, and then this methodology is just supplied the next year, updating is super efficient. Whereas manual teams on the other hand were struggling with a consistent interpretation as a result of human subjectivity, which meant that before Ecopia, Detroit was paying to have their impervious surfaces actually recreated each year. So you can imagine that was a pretty expensive and time consuming process. And yeah, so as we're gonna show here, this manual extraction process was really time consuming, um, which meant the city was just doing their fee calculation on completely outdated data. Uh, and so when they were trying to get an update, Detroit would wait 14 to 18 months to receive their new data, making it almost two years old by the time they received it, which as you can imagine, doesn't lead to very happy citizens when it comes to their tax reports when it's not as accurate. But once working through Ecopia, they're getting their impervious surface maps now six weeks from the imagery being flown. And kind of one of the other last main problems um, that was happening was that, you know, there was a lot of integration costs. So when Ecopia or one of our partners like Wolper begin a project, they're gonna work really collaboratively with the client to set up a sustainable model that meets your goals, really working to reduce those burdensome integration costs. And so what we like to do and our partners will do is define the scope and provide guidance on how it can be designed to enable that updating and then have that data kind of uh, make sense with existing data sets, making again that use really seamless for you. Um, and then, of course, we're always looking for feedback um, for potential improvements as well, um, especially as we continue to expand kind of what would be available off the shelf from a content perspective, but of course, for your specific use case as well. And so just having this very client centric approach that really focuses on offering the best in quality, the best in speed, um, and really just the best support is why the city of Detroit truly views Ecopia as a partner. And so not only did they find that a thousand manual hours are saved each year as a result of our high quality deliveries, they also identified a 2% impervious surface change annually, which resulted in a 5.6 million discrepancy on their stormwater utility fee, which is pretty huge for a city. And then after three years together, of course, the city is now expanding to have Ecopia extract an additional 15 features. Um, and then of course, renew that for multi-year term. So we, again, something else that's really a testament to our quality and what we're trying to offer clients is that we always continue to work with our clients long after it's not just one project that's being done. And so another meaningful application of Ecopia's foundational vector data has been in the emergency services sector. And so I think GP, well not I think, we know that GPS, GPS systems have been on cell phones since the 90s and the ability to accurately position triple zero callers with this was actually though quite limited. So as we had more emergency calls coming through on cell phones, instead of landlines, a methodology for positioning these callers had to be developed. And at first, when a triple zero call would come in, the position of the caller would be provided in a large radius based on the telecommunication tower it was closest to. And you can see that here in this, uh, in this photo. Now, you know, we're seeing improvements in the GPS of cell phones. And so a more precise horizontal position is provided meeting the five meter requirements of Australia's advanced mobile location pro uh, program, but the vertical positioning remains a challenge. And so in 2020, the US government put a three meter vertical positioning accuracy mandate in place to help improve emergency service providers ability to really effectively respond to triple zero calls. So while the horizontal accuracy requirements were obviously helping to determine where a person was located, it's definitely better than just pinging a cell phone or tower. But if the building had multi stories, there was actually no way to tell where that caller was located. And in such a mission critical application, not having that knowledge wasn't acceptable because minutes really do matter at that point. So to help broadband providers remain compliant with the government's requirements, our partner NextNav created a height identification solution for these calls. But they in turn had to demonstrate to the FCC and telecommunication 
telecommunication providers that this next generation system could meet the regulatory requirements that were put in place, which meant they had to validate their heights against an authoritative data set. So next I went through the same process most geospatial data, data users are going to do. They started by exploring the government's existing resources to understand if any of the 3D data could be used to support their validation. And while they definitely found accurate data sets, they couldn't really find it consistently across the country. And many times what they were finding that was open um, was only two dimensional and still out of date. And so since that avenue didn't work, the team then proceeded to evaluate open data. And they quickly found the source wouldn't work as well as it was full of geometry errors, out of date and missing just way too much information. So the team decided to go to the commercial market to understand what they could purchase, but they ran into that same problem we've kind of been speaking to several times today is that if they wanted to have the high quality they needed, they were going to have to spend a lot of money and wait over a year and a half to get that accurate and complete countrywide data set. And so I'm not exaggerating when I'm speaking to the lack of viable options in the market because due to the high stakes nature of NextNav's use case, they had no room to compromise on accuracy and they had to look into every single option for data validation. So that meant they reviewed data from every single 3D provider in the US and through that process, Ecopia was identified as the only company that NextNav could rely on to help them save lives. So our 3D building footprint geometry always reflected what that building looked like in real life. We had the full country available and off the shelf. And despite those variations in topology, you know, super flat regions, very mountainous regions, the data was consistent and always exceeded that three meter accuracy requirement. And in addition to this, Ecopia would also maintain this data each year to ensure that NextNav and of course the emergency service providers always had access to current information and could get citizens the help they needed as quickly as possible. And so this partnership between Ecopia and NextNav was so successful, Ecopia's data is now being actually brought into dispatch centers to help guide the emergency responders to the location. Again, providing more time savings in these mission critical situations and just making citizens' lives much safer. So with that, um, I think I've given you an idea of how this 3D content can be used and the kind of change it's bringing to the geospatial data world. Um, and again, the impacts of the insights that can be achieved with Ecopia and Wolpert. So give the floor back to Dan to speak to some more Australia specific work and then I'm sure we'll open up for some questions. Thanks, Ab Thanks Abigail. Great to uh, learn more about the land cover product and see some of those great, great use cases where it's uh, where it's being employed in, in other parts of the world. So something that's just a little bit more of a, a local context, um, a little bit similar to what Abigail was presenting on the Detroit Water Authority, albeit at a uh, at a smaller scale. But um, this is one that I particularly like because it's really just a fairly, uh, you know, from the outset, a fairly simple problem, um, and the solution has really been achieved by using um, this great um, land cover data set. So this was a, a council in Australia that approached us and. Um, similar to the Detroit Water Authority, they were looking to you know, review and, uh, and adjust their, their stormwater levies on, uh, on all of their ratepayers. So what they wanted was they wanted to identify all the vacant land within the LGA um, to be able to figure out uh, who had um, basically impervious services on their land and should have stormwater levies and, and who didn't. So the way that we uh, we approached this was uh, working with Ecopia to calculate an impervious uh, surface feature set. Um, and you can see the uh, layers that we isolated there being uh, buildings, driveways, um, other impervious surfaces, pavements and, uh, and swimming pools. We then uh, ran a fairly simple uh, GIS uh, analysis uh, routine to figure out where we had intersections with the detected uh, impervious uh, data sets and the uh, the cadaster which was provided by the uh, by the client and from that we were able to determine well these are all, all your vacant lots and then for the ones that weren't vacant and had services we were able to calculate a percentage of coverage to help the uh, the council in determining the appropriate uh, stormwater levies to uh, to apply to the ratepayers so once again look very very simple application um, yeah, and the end result was uh, a much more accurate assessment of, uh, of stormwater levies and better revenue generation for, uh, for the council. 
Uh, so with that, um, we've got one call to action before we uh, open to uh, to any questions. And look, as Abigail mentioned before, one of the things that we're really keen um, to get is feedback from yourself. So the you know, potential users of this data as to what are your use cases um, you know, and you know, does the data meet your expectations or, or what do you think? So what we've got is a 20 square kilometre data set that's been produced over Melbourne and we've made this available um, for you to use for evaluation. So on the screen there, we've got a, a QR code and also a, a shortened link. Now we will, uh, for anyone that's not able to access it through the uh, through the screen here, we'll also distribute that link uh, after the webinar. But yeah, really keen to see you uh, um, sign up for the evaluation data set. Uh, we'll get it sent to you uh, for download uh, immediately. And then we'll uh, certainly be following up to, uh, to get some feedback and, and see what your thoughts are. Uh, so look, I might leave that uh, QR code and link up on the screen uh, for just a little bit longer, but uh, with that, we'll uh, open the floor to, to any questions. Uh, there hasn't hasn't been any any in the chat so far, but um, would certainly be keen to hear any questions that uh, anyone might have. All right. Um, We've got one question in the chat, which is which is good. Um, so, what's the turnaround time for a uh, one square kilometre? Uh, so, the answer to that is this is a an off the shelf data set that we're uh, we're producing. So, the turnaround time is um, is reasonably quick. Um, generally, how we've been treating this for most of our uh, off the shelf data sets in Australia. So, what we're featuring here is a three D land cover product. Um, uh, Woolpert Asia Pacific also has some off the shelf data sets in terms of um, LOD2 and LOD3 models and, uh, and then 3D photo mesh. Uh, where we've got off the shelf data, uh, it's generally um, you know, one to two days, just depending on, uh, on what formats uh, are requested. Um, and what is the CAD format? Um, and is CAD watertight surfaces with no holes? Um, is that something? Uh, so I think for the 3D building models there, um, Abigail was sort of talking about if there are watertight um, surfaces. Are you able to uh, um, comment on that at all? Or is that one that you want to take on, on notice and will respond to uh, post webinar? Yeah, I think just from like a format perspective, that's a great question. And we can, that kind of um, uh, customization is our engineering team is quite uh, flexible. And I know the Wolpert team is really capable as well. So we've done stuff in DWG and so forth. Um, the watertight surfaces is a newer question for me, so maybe we will take that offline and then we can uh, discuss that and get an answer out to Martin so that he has that information. Unless if again, Dan, you wanna <laughs> jump in. Well, I, uh, I would be making a guess and if I, um, you know, may, I think um, for these type of models, um, generally because the way that they're being produced is more of an ex, um, extrusion because it is automated. I think they should be watertight, but we'll uh, we'll confirm that and, and get back to you. And in terms of formats, uh, Martin, uh, look for uh, how we deliver data. We've um, you know, got some expertise in house that generally we can uh, we can convert data into uh, into any format required. So uh, for the three D models that we're typically doing, um, Esri Geo Database is a common format. Um, OBJ, um, I think in meshes we've got S SLPK. Um, I'm definitely going to get myself into trouble if I keep trying to um, talk about more formats. But the moral of the story there is, um, yeah, there's been very few formats that we've been uh, requested that we're not able, able to produce. Uh, Nathaniel Jeffrey, are the land cover categories fixed and standardised worldwide? Uh, can we request custom categories? Uh, so look, Nathaniel, um, and I'll let Abigail comment on this as well. Um, what we'd really encourage there is, um, you know, that's why we're opening this data set up to evaluation. Um, you know, have, have a look at the data, um, see what's there. You know, if there's something that um, you think is, uh, you know, is missed, um, please do let us know and, and get that feedback. Um, Abigail, I'm not sure if you wanted to comment on any differences in the land cover product um, versus some of your regions in Europe versus uh, versus North America. Yeah, I think the idea is that we've had so much experience with clients all over the world. These are kind of the ones that we've seen be consistent. So from a content perspective, we understand that this is going to cover the variety of bases. Um, and so really, like as Dan said, if you want that data turned around in two days and just be able to purchase it like that, like this is kind of our features. But definitely we're at the stage where we're looking to see if there's anything that's 
you know, very custom to Australia, the same, we're doing some work in Ireland. And so fields are really prominent there. So we've added that. So it's kind of a mix of those, but definitely I'd follow Dan's advice and check out the data and give us some feedback. Cause we're always interested to hear how it could be improved and what use cases it can um, help support. Thanks, there we go. Um, so Phillips asked, will this sit along Woolpit's existing products, um, which I assume is manual? Uh, a Woolpit gives extra level of detail. Will this product cap out at LOD 1.3? Uh, the comment that I'll make, um, absolutely, it sits alongside um, our other, other products. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, um, and Stephen, maybe you can put the link to a, a GSIRA site, um, which has a, a good demonstrator just showing the um, the various 3D mesh products and LED two and three textured and untextured models. Uh, but look, ultimately, you know what my my view on it is: there's different geospatial data sets for uh, for different different applications. Uh, certainly, those extremely high resolution um, LED two and LED three models um, have been quite popular uh, with planners and, and architects um, that need to do a really detailed shadow analysis so that exact shape of the building. Is, uh, is really important in uh, in those scenarios. Um, but look, there's also going to be plenty of areas where the you know, LOD uh, you know, 1.3 product, as you put it here, Philip, is uh, is fit for purpose. Um, so yeah, absolutely, it's not a this or, or that. It's, uh, you know, hey, we've got more, more data sets available. Um, so that will suit a, a broader range of, uh, of applications. Uh, and in terms of will the product cap out at LOD 1.3, um, maybe Abigail, I don't know if you want to talk to that. Um, I'd be, uh, I'm sure at some point in time in our in our careers, uh, we'll see completely automated uh, generation of uh, LED2 and LED3 model. I don't know what the time time frames is in on that, but maybe uh, if you wanted to comment anything on uh, Ecopia's uh, R&D development roadmap. Yeah, I think just um, in like such a public setting, really, I would just lean to really like what we've done as a company. And so 10 years ago, we were just extracting building footprints. And we spent five years really learning how to do those like 2D building footprints. Then we expanded to like a land cover and now we're doing 3D land cover. So we're really like, that's what we want to do with our partners as they continue to expand what they're capturing. And as Dan had spoken to, there's such a breadth of different types of even just imagery they can capture and what's being, um, what's really like can be digitized. So we're always going to work to add more features and to get to that next level of detail. Um, and definitely that's that's what we're striving towards. But I think to Dan's point, there's also um, always gonna be room for kind of both products and you know, the manual teams do. There's some features that aren't even gonna be well suited to automation. So there's always gonna be a space for that. It's just, this is again, really looking at that foundational layer. All right, um, we've got uh, Callum from Decker is uh, asking a few great questions here. So the first one is on, uh, is on multi, multi year topology um so look, initially the um initial build of this product will be based on on a single epoch but the uh, intention is to then um capture new imagery each year uh to then up to update that to allow for some of those change detection scenarios uh, that you're you're alluding to there uh, in terms of um you know going going backwards in time um so we're looking to do an epoch of, of 2023 as our uh, as our first uh, off the bat um, data set, uh, look where there is access to um, previous years um, imagery or where we've got imagery. Um, that's certainly something that we could we could consider um, if there's a, if there's demand for it. So you know, once again, sort of comes back to a look at the, get the evaluation data set. Let us know if you've got a, got need for it, and then happy to happy to talk about some of the options. Um, there's then a question on what image data has been used has been used. Um, so look, the, the imagery data that we're um, using for this product is captured from a, from fixed wing uh, manned aircraft uh, using um, a very large format uh, format camera. Generally, the uh, resolution that that imagery is captured at is between um, 7.5 to, to 15 centimeters, uh, uh, depending on sometimes if there's any other applications that we've got for the imagery and also uh, one of the other uh, factors that's been happening in um, in Australia in uh, the last uh, few years is just air traffic control and, uh, and access. So sometimes we're not always given uh, clearance at the exact height that we want to get resolutions. So um, the fact that we've got a little bit of flexibility um, just gives us uh, yeah, more certainty in, in capturing this data. And here's maybe a good one for you, Abigail. 
um, how do you verify the accuracy of the, of the land cover classification results? Yeah. And Yang, just to expand for if you're the one meter specific stuff um, that we built for NOAA was actually built off of 15 and 30 centimeter aerial imagery. So again, we are taking the 15,000 kilometers squared of aerial imagery from um, Wolpert isn't going to slow us down or cause any issues. Like it's definitely a process we have refined. And so it's something that we definitely could work off of. Um, so it was high resolution. And then when it comes to the accuracy of the land cover classification results, everything's obviously dependent on what we're seeing in the imagery. Um, and so that's really what that's what's driving this extraction. So um, the accuracy is accurate to what is visible um, in the image. You can't, you know, if there's something completely hidden by trees, you're not gonna be able to pick that up. But that's what we're looking at. And then um, when we're actually going to uh, consider like the full metrics, we do have um, kind of six key factors we're looking at and the Wolpert team would be happy to send you some documentation on that for you to have after uh, this call. All right, um, great to see all the, uh, all the questions coming through. Uh, will the slides become available and or will there be a recording after the webinar? Um, unless uh, Stephen from our marketing team shoots me, I believe the answer is uh, is yes and yes. We'll uh, distribute the slides and uh, I do believe we've uh, we've been recording this as well, Stephen. That is correct, um, yeah, we'll definitely get there's that out. Great. Um, there's another question there on change detection. Um, that's probably one that we might reach out offline and sort of find out what kind of change detection uh, you're after, um, unless there was anything that you wanted to uh, talk about there, Abigail. Yeah, and I think real, I can just, the change detection we're looking at is pretty much like, was this feature added? Was it, uh, rem okay, Was is this a new tree? So added, did this tree get removed? Um, is it gone? So again, was the feature removed? Was it modified? A tree is not a great example for that, but a sidewalk, right? You might have added an extension to it. Um, and then has there been no change? That's the standard kind of four categories. Again, as Dan said, if you have feedback, that's definitely welcome. And it's just, it's part of our standard workflow to be looking for these, um, but definitely for more details on that, we can definitely take it offline. Thanks, Abigail. Uh, there's another one on the image data, whether it's RGB or a multispectral. Uh, so it's just uh, RGB images, um, which is suitable for uh, for this application. Uh, if you've got something that requires um, four band imagery or near infrared in addition to RGB, um, we do have sensors in our fleet um, that we can use for those applications. So happy to happy to reach out and see if there's any particular requirements or use cases that you have there that need uh, you know more than just uh, RGB imagery. And then we've got uh, what's the coverage like Australia, um, Australian cities. So you know, this is a product that uh, the Ecopia has in, in North America as well. But here in Australia, the focus is on the uh, on the major capital cities. And um, off the bat, we're looking at about 12,000 square kilometres of coverage. So it will include um, suburban areas in, uh, in Australian cities as well. Uh, we're not uh, particularly looking at, at rural at this stage, um, just where uh, we've got the uh, the majority of the population. Uh, but look, certainly, um, you know, this is uh, um, a program that we're looking to uh, to expand and build. So, uh, you know, hopefully, in a, in a few years' time, we'll uh, we'll be covering uh, you know, even even higher proportion of the uh, of the population. All right. Um, with that, hopefully, we've uh, left the um, evaluation agreement up uh, long enough, and Stephen also posted it in the chat. Um, yeah, uh, if there's no other further questions, I mean, if there's anything that pops up later, please do reach out um, you know, or if you're going back over the slides or watching the recording, um, we're only uh, an email away. But other than that, thank you everyone for your time. Abigail, thank you for uh, for staying up late um, and certainly appreciate uh, all of your uh, all of your input. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And as always, a pleasure to connect with the Wolpert team. Have a good have a good day. Thanks, everyone.